Most of the time, they just don't. Good evening and welcome to Our Storied River, Friends of the Mississippi River's first ever virtual evening celebrating the Mississippi River. I'm your MC, Miss Shannon Paul, and I'm honored to be here tonight to support Friends of the Mississippi River's work to protect, restore, and enhance one of the great rivers of the war and our hometown river. To kick off our festivities, I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's first two storytellers, Jim Bear Jacobs and Danny Gibbons. Jim Bear and Danny join us from the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers, known as Bedote, a sacred site for the Dakota people and a place of significance and interwoven histories for many. Let's watch. I'm Jim Bear Jacobs. I am a citizen of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation for the United States. I grew up my entire life in and around St. Paul, around this river, and I have come to know and understand and fall in love with the stories that this river holds. We are here in a place that is sacred for the Dakota people. This place is known in the Dakota language as Bedote, a place where two bodies of water come together. We're at the confluence of the Mississippi River and the Minnesota River. This is a place of beginning. The first light to enter human eyes was the sun rising over the eastern river bluffs. The first sound to enter human ears were the birds as they greeted the morning in this valley. The first marks made into the soil by a human footprint were laid into this sand on this riverbank. This is also a place where Minnesota, as a state, begins. Fort Snelling sits directly over my left shoulder. Built in 1820, Fort Snelling served as an active U.S. military outpost. Where I'm sitting right now are a number of trees that bear the marks, the scars of years and years of having cargo boats and ships tie off to them, literally wearing a mark into the trunks of these trees. So many stories of so many Minnesotans emerge here. Decades upon decades of boats making landfall here and the indigenous people saw all of this history unfold. They greeted them with welcome, but that welcome and hospitality was not reciprocated. In 1862, after decades of unjust practices and broken treaties, a war broke out in western Minnesota. Following that war, when the Dakota people were captured, they were placed in a concentration camp from November of 1862 to the spring of 1863. The travesty and the inhumanity that was witnessed along the banks of this river is unspeakable. These same trees that bear these marks had ropes tied around them from cattle barges that would carry them into exile. But the Dakota story doesn't end with their exile because just like these trees bear the marks and hold the stories, the Dakota people, their story can be witnessed all across this state. We owe it to those indigenous people to know these stories, to pay honor to these stories, to honor and respect the land and the rivers that they hold sacred. It's important to understand that for us, the story is not contained in time, but our stories are held in sacred spaces, in the rivers, in the trees, in the valleys. That's why I come down to this river so many times a year to immerse myself in the story, to, to pay honor to the indigenous people of this land. I'm rooting myself in a story that is older than anything else around me and hold as sacred those stories and these trees, this soil, this river, as living relatives, sacred and worthy of protection and worthy of voice. 
My name is Pastor Danny Givens. I'm the pastor of Above Every Name Ministries. I am born and raised right here in the historic black community of Rondo, which is located probably about a couple miles from where we are now. At this particular spot is where we see an intersection or a confluence, if you will, of the two stories, the story of the indigenous native people who are Dakota to this land and the African descendant slave folks just as our indigenous siblings were uh, removed from these lands via cattle barges, these cattle barges had come up from the southern parts of the state full of enslaved Africans who were being sold uh, into slavery here at Fort Snelling. And so you would ask, how is it that there were cattle barges full of enslaved Africans that were being shipped up here to the state of Minnesota where slavery was said to be illegal and or outlawed? And because the Fort Snelling was under federal law and slavery was still legal at a federal level. This beautiful body of water carries the narrative of not only the Dakota people who are native and indigenous to this land, but carries the narrative of formerly enslaved Africans who made their way here in search of freedom. This river speaks to promise. This river speaks to liberty. But unfortunately, the currents of this river are muddy with the oppression of patriarchy, are muddy with the intentionality of greed of those with the intent of stealing land from the original people here. My people, the formerly enslaved African-American people, were able to move northern up road to the Rondo community and build a community and an economy and a socioeconomic landscape that will prove to be so powerful that the government itself will come and disrupt that community by running an interstate right through the heart of this Rondo community. 1956 to 1968 began a displacement of well over 500 African-American families in the affluent Rondo community. It was well over 300 businesses that were lost. And more than anything, the sacred footprint of our people on this shared land that we share with our Dakota siblings was almost erased forever. Thankfully, we have stories. We have this river. We have our siblings, our relatives, the trees, and the earth, and the soil that continue to remind us of the power and presence of our people and how we can rebound from the oppressions that are weighed upon us. Thank you to Jim Bear and Danny, as well as filmmakers Tom Ryder, Donnie Koshial, and Will Stock for sharing those powerful stories and confluence of those histories. Their words remind me of the importance of finding a connection to the natural world during these incredibly challenging times. The river has been a place of peace and solace for me and for so many in this season of uncertainty. Many thanks to all of you for choosing to spend your evening with us to ensure a healthy and accessible river for all whenever we need it. I also want to say a big thanks to tonight's generous sponsors, including Marathon, XL Energy, Creative Fundraising Advisors, Big River Real Estate, Delta Dental, Native Resource Preservation, as well as the dozens of individual sponsors who made tonight's event possible. Now, let's keep the party rolling. I want to remind you that we have an auction of fun items and experiences going on right now. In fact, if you've been admiring the stunning painting of the river behind me, this is just one of the many one-of-a-kind river-related items and experiences that we are auctioning off tonight. Now, the auction will remain open until 9 p.m. and the bidding is easy. Just click on the auction button at the bottom of your screen here and that'll take you to the auction page. The value of an accessible, clean, and healthy river has been magnified so much during this crisis. And we're here tonight to raise $150,000, at least, maybe more, to ensure the long-term health and vitality of our great rivers and communities. Now, I invite you to think about your own river story. 
If you live, work, or play in the Twin Cities metropolitan region or anywhere up or downstream, the river has impacted and changed each of us in subtle and sometimes seismic ways, whether we're conscious of it or not. We heard the story of a duo whose histories were forever woven together by the river's constant current. You know, we'll hear from a musician who toured the Mississippi by canoe to discover not only his muddy roots, but also his true love. And we'll hear the story of a mother whose family found sense of peace in the river and a place to grieve the impossible. And then you'll hear from me, someone who grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, where dry river beds and an empty concrete irrigation ditch were my reality as a child. So when my family moved to Minneapolis in 1996, a place whose heart was this flowing, vibrant, life-giving river, it felt almost like walking into a fairy tale. In a time of turmoil and division, I know of nothing more powerful than storytelling to bring people together. And again, we thank you for being here with us tonight. Now, I'm happy to introduce some of the members of the Friends of Mississippi River staff and board to share their own personal connections to our great river and the impact, the work made pos the impact of the work made possible with your support. Hi, my name's Alex. I'm one of FMRC ecologists, and I'm here at Orvin Ole Olson Park in North Minneapolis. It's a riverfront park owned by the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board, where FMR has been working to restore diverse, high-quality native prairie habitat right here along the Mississippi River. And aside from the stunning views of blooming wildflowers with the downtown skyline in the background, this site is really special to me. It's both where I had my first official date with and later where I proposed to my wife Sarah. Here at Ole, FMR has been able to replace turf grass and invasive shrubs and trees with native wildflowers and grasses that are both beautiful to people and vital to pollinators, wildlife, and water quality. And because of its location here in the city, we've been able to engage neighbors, local residents, and local volunteer groups in the care and stewardship of the site. And this awesome riverfront prairie is just one of over 30 FMR restoration sites totaling over 1,400 acres where we are working to create this much needed habitat. Because at FMR, we believe that protecting and restoring habitat has far-reaching benefits because we believe that both wildlife and people deserve access to diverse, high-quality parks and natural areas where they can survive and thrive. Hi, I'm Trevor Russell, FMR's Water Program Director. And I'm Peter LaFontaine, our Agricultural Policy Manager. We're at Lilydale Park, just west of Harriet Island, downstream of the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi Rivers at Bedote, before it's Snelling. We both live nearby, and my dog Rio loves to swim in the river. So does my dog, Juna. We spend a couple of days each week walking up and down the riverbanks. As Twin Cities residents, we get our drinking water from the Mississippi River. But it's more than just a drinking water resource. It's the lifeblood of an entire landscape. Here in Minnesota, much of that landscape is agricultural, which is why we at FMR are working to reduce ag pollution and help the river return to a clean and natural state. So the river, in turn, can sustain ecosystems and communities from Itasca to the Gulf of Mexico. At FMR, we're really excited to be building support for new clean water crops that can actually return our great river to health. Because at FMR, we believe that everyone deserves clean water. Hi, I'm Sophie, FMR's Volunteer and Outreach Coordinator. And I'm Kate, FMR Youth Coordinator. We're here at Willow Brook on the east side of St. Paul, which is a DNR riverfront site where FMR works with youth to restore habitat. Growing up in the Twin Cities, places like Willowbrook, natural treasures and urban landscapes were important to me in building a connection to the natural world. And I feel so fortunate to help other youth build those connections today. Every year we work here with Harding High School students to help monitor and remove invasive species. Visiting regularly over the years allows students to not only experience Willowbrook's restoration, but to see the impact they make. 
that what they do to steward this place contributes to the health of the entire river system. And this is just one of the dozens of sites where we work with roughly 2,000 students a year. Because at FMR, we believe that everyone deserves strong and long-lasting connections to their local environment. And we emphasize building those connections early to foster lifelong environmental stewardship. I'm Colleen, FMR's River Corridor Director. Hi, I'm Paul, FMR board member. We're here in my neighborhood of Northeast Minneapolis, and this is where I come to watch the Heron's Nest along the river. Across the river is the Upper Harbor Terminal site. This is a former shipping port that's now being planned for redevelopment. As a longtime North Minneapolis resident and urban design professional, I've worked on many projects in my community. The double-edged sword is that sometimes they create great amenities and opportunities, and other times they create displacement and gentrification, which we don't want to see happen here. We're concerned that this current redevelopment plan delivers more benefits to the developer than to neighbors. So we're advocating for a more equitable and just development plan that builds community ownership and wealth for Northsiders. We also hope to see a project that respects and restores this riverfront location by including great parks and trails, thoughtful building design, and innovative environmental features. We believe the Mississippi River belongs to everyone. At FMR, we'll keep fighting for equitable development in our communities. We'd like to thank our supporters for making this work possible. Hi, I'm Whitney Clark, president of the Mississippi River's executive director. And I'm Ronnie Brooks, the chair of FMR's board. And on behalf of the board of directors and the staff, I want to tell you how much we appreciate your welcoming us into your homes unmasked tonight. As we hear and celebrate the stories of the river and hear the tales of individuals moved by its experience, we must acknowledge that we're living in very strange but important times. We are now entering our seventh month of pandemic-induced isolation. We're about five short weeks before what promises to be a very consequential election. And I'm asked many times how FMR is navigating these challenging times. And my answer is that we're learning, along with many of you, I'm sure, what it means to be adaptive, resilient, constant, and giving. We are, in short, learning to be like the river. Indeed. We've long asked all these things of the river, and now we ask even more. And yet the Mississippi continues to give us valuable gifts, so important in these unsettled times. We need to remember that this river is the habitat for strikingly beautiful signs of fall. And it also provides a pathway south for our native birds. And the river remains the primary source of drinking water for a million area residents. It enhances, enhances the beauty, the livability, and the vitality of our community. And it powers a large part of the regional economy. And perhaps most relevant now, the river soothes as it flows. For millennial times, people have understood the power of nature to heal. When so many of us are taking steps to safeguard our well-being and the well-being of those around us, we can turn to the life-affirming force of the river for renewal and revitalization. At Friends of the Mississippi River, we're working each day at makeshift desks, with, at our dining room tables, with our restless children and pets at our feet to protect, restore, and celebrate the great river that sustains us all. As you heard in the video uh, from my colleagues just moments ago, this is a, not a time where we're slowing down. In fact, our work is actually accelerating. It's an exciting time of growth and opportunity for FMR and for the river. We're innovating for clean water. We are leading a first of its kind multi-sector initiative to develop clean water crops, markets, and policies to support a landscape scale transformation 
of our agricultural practices, not just in Minnesota, but across the Midwest. We're making new friends and building relationships at a time of distancing by lifting up and supporting local voices to connect neighbors and neighborhoods to the river in places like North Minneapolis and Cottage Grove. We're working with young people to train and inspire the next generation of environmental leaders. And every day we're working to protect and bring back to health those special riverfront places that uh, like our, our parks, our natural areas, our bluffs and our bottomlands, the places where we go to explore, to connect with nature, and to find solace. But we can't do any of this work ourselves. Tonight, we're asking each of you to give generously to ensure a healthy and accessible river for all. Now, I'm gonna invite my friend Glenn Flatabo to the stage. Uh, Glenn is a longtime river rat and FMR supporter, and uh, he's going to help show how uh, you all can participate tonight. Welcome, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. Whitney and Ronnie, thank you. Thank you for your leadership and for being here tonight. I do want to share just two things with everyone personally. My wife and I and our two daughters, we live in South Minneapolis along the river on West River Parkway. And when COVID hit in the middle of March and they shut down West River Road, and I watched every single day, I watched families come to the river and kids would bike and kids would walk and families could social distance. Through the, every single day when I was watching this happen, I felt thankful that we lived right next to the river. I felt thankful that as a community that we can enjoy what mo many Americans can only see a couple times in their life. The second thing that I thought, and Whitney was a little too modest, is I felt thankful that we had FMR. FMR is now one of the largest and most successful local organizations protecting a river in the United States. And we are so blessed for their leadership. My friends, this is the moment that we can rally as a community. We can rally right now. And our goal with this virtual event tonight is to see if, together if we can raise $150,000 or perhaps $175,000 as a community. And here's where the funds will go. It'll go to three top priorities. As Whitney just said, it'll help us fund a very innovative project to curb the amount of pollution going into the river. Secondly, it'll allow us to create additional access points in North Minneapolis and Northeast Minneapolis so those citizens can enjoy the river. And thirdly, it'll allow us to fund some work for youth to create additional opportunities for them to come and experience and enjoy the river. This is important. We can do this as a community. And listen to this, everybody. We are currently just under $130,000. So we've already raised $130,000. We are getting close to the $150,000 mark. And I need to thank the following families for stepping up to help us get to $130,000. A huge thank you to Peter and Mary Gove for your gift of $10,000 tonight. Peter and Mary gave us $10,000. One of our founders, of course, and a longtime board member. Kathy Stack, she gave us $5,000. Kathy, thank you for that gift. My friends Judd Dayton and Shelly Dayton, they gave us $5,000. Judd and Shelly, we appreciate your support. Sue Vento, I will say to you, Sue, I'm assuming you're watching. I miss seeing you tonight. Thank you for all that you've done. You can bid on all the auction items, Sue, which I know you love to do. But Sue gave us $2,500. Sue, thank you. Lori Bruno gave us $1,200. And we also have a $1,000 gift from Susan Price. Here's the last surprise. And this is a big, big deal. Chad and Maggie Dayton, they live on Summit Avenue. They've been longtime supporters. When they heard that we were doing a virtual event, they wanted to step up and help us with a very special gift. Chad and Maggie have agreed that they will match right now every donation, every new donation, dollar for dollar up to $25,000 or anyone that's willing to increase your gift up to $25,000. As an entire FMR community, Chad and Maggie, we are so grateful for your support tonight. We can do this together. If everyone wants to make a donation right now, we're going to give you 30 seconds to do this. Get your bidding fingers ready. You can go to make a donation icon and plug in your gift right now. Let's see if we can get past $150,000 in this moment.
Oh my gosh, it's been absolutely amazing to see those numbers because Glenn's on it. He's watching this whole thing. And so we're going to check back in with you in just a few minutes. And Glenn will be back up here and we'll tell you where we are at. Thank you to everybody that has supported us so far. And we have plenty of time still in this broadcast for you to do more. So thanks to Glenn and thanks to all of you for continuing to make your contribution to support AFMR's, FMR's critical work tonight. Now, I'm happy to introduce our next storyteller, Gwen Calvetti. She's going to share the follies of paddling the mighty Mississippi with an overly confident partner. Good evening. I've lived all but two years of my life within spitting distance of the Mississippi River. Growing up in Northeast Minneapolis, my acquaintanceship was mainly limited to pitching rocks or hurtling down the hill on my bike toward the river, stopped by traffic on East River Road. But when I was at the U of M, a friend invited me one night to go with her to the outings club on campus. I think it was called the Trekkers. And we did wonderful things. We would go rock climbing or camping and backpacking in nearby state parks. And one glorious day, we put canoes in on Lake Minnetonka and paddled the Minnehaha Creek to Lake Nokomis. Though I had never been a jock, when I took that paddle in my hand, I knew I had found my sport. Since that time, I've paddled many of the rivers that feed the Mississippi, the Namakagan, the Chippewa, the Trempolo, the La Crosse, the Black, the Kickapoo, the Cannon, the Root, and Old Man River itself. Now when I met my husband, I had the upper paddle, so to speak. He was a jock, but paddling wasn't one of his sports until he and some of his historical reenacting friends decided that they were going to start doing authentic birch bark treks, wearing authentic Voyager clothing with authentic Voyager accoutrements, 300 miles on the upper Mississippi River. Now he had the upper paddle. And when we get in a canoe, he's in the back steering and I'm in the front watching for hazards. And if I see one, I'll hear commands barked at me like, dig, dig, and don't grab the gunnels. Now, if you don't know what that means, the gunnels are simply the top edges of the canoe. And if you hit rough water and grab the gunnels instead of digging in your paddle, you're pretty much guaranteed to tip. I had never tipped the canoe, but I complied and would begin to dig. Now one glorious, glorious late fall afternoon, we decided we were going to go paddling. It was actually the day after Thanksgiving. And being the day after Thanksgiving, we knew that we needed to wear a little bit more than just a t-shirt. We had on our down jackets and our long underwear and our Sorrel boots along with our life vests. And we were going to paddle in the backwaters between Ferryville and Prairie du Chien. Now you might ask, it's almost December in Wisconsin. Why are you paddling? Oh, duck hunting. You'd be wrong. We were hunting all right, but we were hunting something else, geocaches. Now for the uninitiated, geocaching is a game where people hide things somewhere and then other people use their GPSs with the coordinates provided to try and find the thing that's hidden, sign a piece of paper and put it back to prove that we found it and someone had hidden a series of geocaches on islands on the Wisconsin side of the Mississippi. As a friend once explained to an onlooker, geocaching, it's a sport for nerds. So there we were, two nerds in our canoe, 
enjoying a wonderful late fall day. Thinking ahead to our stop at the Great River Roadhouse to celebrate should we find them all. And find them all we did. We were working our way back to the boat landing where we parked our car. Now this boat landing wasn't a regular canoe launch. It was designed for the bass boats and the fishing boats and the bigger boats that go out on the river. Big concrete parking lot with a ramp leading into the river. And next to the ramp was a huge boulder that bellied right up to the edge of the ramp. My husband managed to back us in to the landing with the nose of the canoe wedged between that rock and the concrete. He got out and he was standing one foot on the concrete and one foot on the boulder. He grabbed the gunnels and put his knees in between and then hollered, okay, I've got it stabilized. Not knowing just how deep the water really was here, I got down low to keep my center of gravity low as well and started to creep forward into the canoe to jump out. As I worked my way forward, I suddenly felt the canoe listing to one side, me along with it, and before I realized what was happening, the canoe was flipped, and I was underneath it, soaking wet. I came up into the air hole underneath the overturned canoe, and then I thought, oh no, my camera, my GPS. Somehow I managed to retrieve those things held my breath, ducked under, came out the other side of the canoe and glared at my husband. He looked at me and said, I, that boulder was wet. I didn't think it was wet and my foot slipped. I'm sorry. There I was, dripping wet with some of the late summer's bloom still clinging to my clothes here and there. There was no way we were stopping at the Great River Roadhouse, uh-uh. We got everything loaded up and strapped on, hopped into the car, turned on the heat so that I wouldn't get hypothermia the 40 or so miles back home. But since that time, Whenever we are in the canoe and he starts to holler from behind me, don't grab the gunnels. I can simply turn around and smile and say, who has ever tipped the canoe ever? <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Gwen, for the levity. Goodness knows we can use a little bit more of that these days. And for reminding us the joy that is to be found on the water. All right, I also want to thank Lauren Nimi, who workshopped with many of tonight's storytellers to hone their stories. Lauren is a National Storytelling Network Life Achievement Award winner, and we've been so grateful for him and his time and his experience. All right, now I'm happy to welcome Glenn back to join me. It's one of my favorite parts of the evening, the auction. So you can view all of our selections uh, by continuing to go to that uh, auction button at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to talk about four, but there are tons of things for everybody to bid on there, right? And listen to this, Shannon. We are now over $146,000 in our funded need. We are super close to getting to $150,000. Thank you for all of your support. We are going to hit $150,000, and we may get close to one seventy-five. dollars We have four amazing auction items. You can bid till 9 p.m., and there's 20 additional items on our website. Right. Every time you bid, you're making a huge difference. Shannon, we're going to have fun with this. Okay, Tell we're us gonna about item number one. I'm just excited to be next to you. I want to slow everybody down because uh, every time I tell somebody that I went and got an auctioneer's license, they say, do you know Glenn Flatabow? <laughs> you are like a celebrity as far as auctioneers. Tell book. my so parents and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad to be able to work with you again. So we're going to start with our first of our four items we're going to do. It is a three night stay at a St. Croix Valley Bluff Top Cabin. 
The winning bidder of this item will enjoy a relaxing getaway at a beautiful cabin on the bluff overlooking the St. Croix River, a national scenic riverway. It's located south of Osceola, Wisconsin. The cabin is a short drive from the Twin Cities, but feels worlds away. Osceola's downtown commercial district is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places and Features, shops, restaurants, and stunning Cascade Falls. This is a big deal, everybody. It's item number one in the action. We need to thank, again, Peter and Mary Goat for all that they've done. Peter's one of our founders, of course, and has served on our board. Mary, thank you for your support. This is a great item. Really, it's about a $2,500 value. It's a three-night stay. Again, it sleeps six people. You can negotiate any, any time between now and June of 2021. Shannon, the current bid is $1,250, so it's a great opportunity. Have fun bidding on Peter and Mary's place. By the way, it's only like $5 a month on your credit card. So you can right. put it on your credit card. And it's seat six. So you can just get you and one other couple and still not have to be right next to each other. It's Ex perfect. Exactly. Absolutely perfect. That's what I want is I want to get away, but then feel like I'm with somebody. It's and perfect. Shannon, our second piece, the artwork, we've had oh. robust bidding in the last 10 minutes. The Which we should. Yes. I'm so glad we're doing this. So to give you a little more information about it, Dream Songs, The Mississippi Within Us, a one-of-a-kind river work by artist Susan Armington. Now, the winning bidder of this painting will take home and original artwork celebrating our community's connections to our beloved hometown river. The exquisite piece measures 60 by 40, so it's taller than I am because I'm tiny, and features handwritten river stories and love letters to the river collected from FMR supporters. Local artist Susan Armington wove these selections together into a community river map that is featured tonight as our backdrop. And I was looking through here and just so many times the things that we put up in our homes are either things that our kids drew and we felt guilty or something that you got at a garage sale. If you want something that really will just be the signature piece in your house, this is your opportunity to make those memories. It's a beautiful piece. A huge thank you again to Susan Armington. She's the artist she is watching tonight. Susan, we are so thankful for your support. The piece is valued at $4,500. It's an amazing item. The other thing that is really inspiring to me about purchasing this tonight, you will never forget purchasing this during COVID to support FMR. 20 years from now, you will look back at this piece in your house and you'll think, God, oh, remember 2020 and I made that gift to support FMR. Thank you for bidding. The more you spend on this, by the way, the more it's worth. So have fun bidding. Right. Our third item, I'm excited about this paddle excursion. Exactly, because this is a great opportunity for you to get out of your house and get an adventure under your belt. So a metro paddle excursion with local river experts. So enjoy a guided paddling excursion on the river for four with our very own river experts, FMR Executive Director Whitney Clark, as well as a noted river historian and author. The day is going to begin with breakfast and coffee on the banks of the Mississippi River before embarking on a day trip to experience the many scenic, cultural, and historic sites along the upper river. And then you'll end your trip. FMR staff will greet you and have a, a celebratory beverage and light snacks. And when we mean light snacks, we're gonna get the good things. It's not just gonna be pizza. I mean, like, it'll be something good. It's a great opportunity. The current bid is $750. By the way, I just amended the description. If you bid super high, the trip will end in St. Louis or the New Orleans. So if you bid super high, you, the further along the river or down the river you go. I also want to like choose your own adventure. It is That's a choose your own is. adventure. You may not come back to Minnesota after you do this. <laughs> I do want to offer a heartfelt and personal thank you to our executive director. Whitney has been with this organization for 23 years, 23 years, and we wouldn't be where we are today without his leadership. Thank you, Whitney, for all that you've done. It's an amazing gift. Deanna and Sue, thank you for your support. Have fun bidding on item number three. Whitney did tell me, by the way, if you spend a lot of money on this, you will not receive a fundraising call from Whitney for six months. So that okay. also helps. Yeah. Here's, here's Whatever the incentive is that you need, we will provide. Yes, That's exactly. It. Our fourth item, Shannon, is a super unique item. Oh, yeah. I was really excited about this because one of the things I didn't get a chance to tell you, Glenn, is that during the middle of our pandemic, pandemic chaos, I bought a house. So now I am in the landscaping business. I'm deciding what I'm going to do. So if you are also trying to figure out some great landscaping option, options for your home, this is what we have for you. A pocket prairie installed by Minnesota Native Landscapes. So the pocket prairie is a little way to make a big impact on the health of our planet. 
The pocket prairie includes 108 perennial locally grown native plants that mature into a stunning piece of important habitat in your yard. Now the native plants are known to attract native pollinators, birds and other wildlife and their filter nutrients uh, will actually be helped because they have a very complex root system. So when you plant a pocket prairie, you're not just putting plants in the ground, you're healing the earth. It's a great item. The value is $2,100, so $2,100 value. By the way, you can use this for your own yard. You can also gift it to somebody. So if you want to gift it to your child or your friends or whomever, you can do that as well. It's if a great you have a neighbor that you have been trying to encourage you to do something Wouldn't that be shocking? Yard, right? You gift it to them and they come home from a vacation and they've got a new landscape. Hey, I think it's a good way to build the community. It's wonderful. <laughs> Lastly, everyone, thank you for all of your support tonight. We cannot thank you enough. We have so many people online. Have fun bidding until 9 p.m. Thank you for all of your fun to need pledges. Shannon Paul, thank you for your leadership and MC and have fun bidding on the rest of the auction. Yes, we appreciate everybody. I'll remind everybody one more time the auction stays open until 9 p.m. and all proceeds, of course, can, can continue to help all of the goals we have here at FMR. So thank you, Ben. And now I am deeply honored to introduce our next storyteller. Sarah Risser, who is here tonight to share a very personal river story. Before she begins, I want to let viewers know that her story involves grief and loss, but is also beautiful and important. So welcome, Sarah. When Henry was born in Singapore in the year of the dragon, I felt like I had won the lottery. It turns out that in Singapore, a lot of people take the Chinese zodiac seriously, and the dragon is the most auspicious sign. They are thought to be strong and loyal, they grow up to be leaders, and when Henry was born, he looked like a little dragon. He was fat and bald, he exuded happiness and love, and he embraced his early childhood with a contagious sort of joyful enthusiasm. But our time abroad came to an end just after Henry's sixth birthday. His pop, I call him Nate, switched jobs, forcing a move back to Minnesota in the middle of January. As our plane approached the Twin Cities, Henry looked down on the Mississippi and its wide riverbed and banks of trees rising up on either side left such a strong impression that he would write about it years later. As we settled into our new lives, it was the Mississippi that gently carried us forward by offering a simple structure to our lives. For me, it was the destination of early morning walks, and for Henry, it became his ultimate after-school playground. It had everything he needed for hours of fun. Rocks and sticks, sand and water. He'd go there with his sister Nina, and they'd scramble up and down trails, explore beaches, dig in soft sandstone. They'd come home muddy, a little scraped up, tired and happy. And as Henry grew, the Mississippi became more and more important to him until it seemed to provide the ballast that made navigating middle and high school a lot easier. He joined the Minnesota Boat Club on Raspberry Island and fell completely for the sport of rowing. Nearly every day from early spring to late fall, he'd row upstream with teammates under the high bridge, through the turbulent swirling water, under the railroad bridge, often all the way to the confluence with the Minnesota. He enjoyed the challenge of rowing on a working river, learning to negotiate wakes thrown by barges and steamboats, and he appreciated that every day offered a different combination of wind and current and light. For a college essay, he wrote that being on the water in a rowing shell sparked joy and was a catalyst for reflection. For Henry's advanced science research project, he studied the effects of ammonia on plain pocketbook muscles. And for his senior internship, he worked with the Mississippi Park Connection, planting rain gardens and hundreds of trees and gravel beds. He especially loved the High Bridge. It connected him to Emmy in West St. Paul, so he drove over it a lot, often with cookies or flowers for his first true love, and on his way back, he would take in its sweeping views across the river up to the cathedral and capital in the distance. He was clear about it. The High Bridge was his favorite place. When Henry came back from his first semester at college, he had a new interest, art history, sparked by Professor Goldman's Art in the Environment class. For his final project, he chose to research Mel Chin's Revival Field, an art installation at the Pig's Eye Landfill, once again channeling his love for the Mississippi. He told me about it as we drove through Wisconsin on our way to ski in Michigan. We were driving alongside the Namakagan River when Henry's voice broke off. An overloaded truck crossed the center line suddenly 
Without giving us time to respond, it loomed up dark and monstrous before crashing into our car with the explosive impact of a bomb going off. I braced against the dash as our car lurched across the road, spun into a ditch and hit a tree with a second jolting impact that shattered my wrist. I sat stunned in a cloud of fumes. My ears rang, little crystals of glass covered everything like a blanket of snow. Henry slumped over the steering wheel, unresponsive. As I was being driven away in an ambulance, I told myself, he'll be okay, he just got knocked out, he'll be okay. Flat on my back, in the Spooner emergency room, in too much pain to sit up, I'm told, the police are here, they want to talk to you. And I want to talk to them too, I want to know when I can see Henry. Three officers enter the room and stand in a line, and then, as if they've rehearsed, they raise their hands to their heads and in solemn unison slowly take off their caps. Your son didn't make it. I feel everything lock up like giant steel doors slamming shut. The next week brings a flood of visitors bearing cards and flowers, books, robes, essential oils, tissues, food, so much food. Why are people bringing food when it's impossible to eat? Nothing makes sense. After the initial surge of love and support begins to recede, a relative drives Nate and me to pick up Henry's ashes. They are in a simple cardboard box. It's exactly what Henry would have wanted. He would have hated the fancy urn. We take a detour on our way home. I sit in the back seat, my hand gently resting on the cardboard box. We stop at the top of the high bridge and get out of the car. The air is bitterly cold and sharp. We stand, looking across the Mississippi, taking in the view that Henry so loved. We are as frozen as the river, unable to accept the blunt terms of our new reality. As winter gives way to spring, I'm drawn back to the Mississippi. The beautiful and predictable spring migration feels healing and therapeutic. I often sit by Pickerel Lake and watch blackbirds and swallows, warblers and orioles. They seem joyful, fully occupied nesting, or fueling up to continue their journeys north. To process the impossible, I've turned to great thinkers. Rumi believed that turning toward what you love will save you. Viktor Frankl believed that love goes beyond the physical person to find its deepest meaning in his spiritual being so that whether or not he is present or even alive isn't important. Nina Henry echoed this sentiment in his senior speech, which he dedicated to his two intentional loves, Nina and the Mississippi River. To Nina, he wrote, the constellations we saw above our tent are the same ones that appear outside my window at home at night. We are able to share these stars as we go off and live independent lives where we can't see each other at the end of every day. We are together in long hikes through canyon lands and late nights looking at the sky, so I realize that as long as you have the mountains and as long as I have the river, we will still have each other. And now I realize that grief is an expression of love not pain. And as long as I have the Mississippi and other rivers to explore, I will always have Henry. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing that powerful story of the river and your son. As a fellow parent, I'm very grateful that you had the healing properties of the river for you and your family. Now finally, let's turn our attention to our tonight's, tonight's final storyteller. David Fort is a musician and paddler, and I simply love his story of what you can discover when music and the Mississippi meet. Welcome, David. Hello, my name is David Fort, and this short story is called The Mighty Mississippi, a love story. Since my first paddle drop, I've been calling people to the water. Years ago, on a cold winter Winnipeg morning, the wind blew softly from the south, notifying me the majestic Mississippi was inviting me back home. Unbeknownst, I would re be rediscovering not only my muddy roots, but also finding true love. Born in Brainerd, overlooking the early workings of a mighty river, Gemini constellation high in the sky, my watery umbilical cord was cut quickly back to the Iron Range Duluth Twin Cities before shuffling north of the Continental Divide, up the Mississippi's twin sister, the Red River, and up further still to nestle restless from kindergarten to high school graduation and the Boreal Shield Cree Territory. 
Northern life was happy and healthy, with an undercurrent of displacement, having music and paddling being two fundamental components of my life. It took me well into my adult life to finally fuse both elements into the River Armada concert series, in which my music project, Twin, would paddle river systems show to show. I had been doing this for a few years when the Mississippi calling overtook me with an obsession, putting all other things to the wayside. My perennial paddling bandmate David Enns, who had already endured the entire length of the Great River years ago, was ready with his trusty Red Wing Minnesota designed guitar and paddle. It was not to be, however, as Dave was hit with Cupid's arrow just weeks before our departure. This new romance could only be celebrated, for anything less would be a betrayal of beautiful, burgeoning love. The first Mississippi tour was booked from Bemidji to La Crosse with one gaping issue. I did not have a paddle partner. I started phoning friends from across the Northland, old summer camp chums, local musicians I thought I could, I thought could fare the trip, but alas, no takers. There was, however, one person I had yet to contact, a young violinist named Brooklyn Sampson, whom I had played with a few times over the summer, and it was clear her talents were endless. I called her up one muggy Winnipeg afternoon and said, do you want to learn a bunch of twin songs in less than a week and go paddle down the Mississippi for little to no money, facing enduring hardships along the way? Brooke paused for a moment before stating, yes, that sounds pretty good. So it was settled. We headed, headed south, purchased a beautiful blue and white secondhand aqualine canoe made in Bemidji, Minnesota in 1988, rehearsing quickly in a small motel before our first performance at Bemidji State Park. Our trusty boat soon adapted the nickname Tanky. Tanky was big, slow, but could handle our large load of instruments, river gear, as well as being able to endure heavy winds and rapids quite well. This first journey down the pr this primary vein of Turtle Island proved to be a true challenge to us as individuals and as a unit. At this point in my life, I was proud, cocky, indestructible, and based on my northern canoe experience, was viewing the Mississippi not as a cakewalk, but as something that could be managed with relative ease. The majestic, mighty Mississippi has many lessons and humbled me immediately. The lazy early flow forced us to paddle all our miles into the big water chain of lakes such as Cass, Winnebagashish, Jay Gold, and the wind tunnel turn at Lake Pepin that has left us in a lurch a few times over the years. Brooke was green on stage and the river, but immediately adapted within days to rise to new challenges. The journey became art militaresque early as we raced against time, starting in the fall fog often as early as 5 a.m. to make it to events cold, wet, and hungry. But the show must go on, even if some forgot we were coming or it was just meager gatherings along the riverbank. Something starts to happen as the days go by on the river. It becomes a strange mix of looking to succeed as an artist, looking out for your safety night after night, bouncing between bears and beer cans at deep wilderness and rural campsites, homelessness hidden in the most wondrous of places, making you question, why do I bother with such modern monetary endeavors at all? Something happens as the mud and water seep deep into your soul. You start to become the river and it becomes you. You identify with it. You speak with it and look forward only to being back upon it, within it, washing away all that has been lost in what you thought you were and what you thought you wanted. Through these lessons, we discovered that music could be so much more, that life could be so much more. We discovered each other and it became clear to me as the days went on, the, the Mississippi called me back for a plethora of reasons, but mostly out of love. As the days became colder and shorter, the locks opening new pathways to life, leaving old ones behind, we had discovered our love for each other. Keeping each other safe and warm in derelict warehouses outside the Twin Cities, navigating with great care the industrial aquatic superhighways the river has become, lying low as tornadoes tore up the west side of the river, singing for our suppers and safe sleeps, Delivering in speech and song all the messages the river had bestowed upon us, hoping others would hear its beautiful voice inside them. The mighty Mississippi River called me back to remind me what true strength is, and that strength is love. To know the water is to love the water. To love the water is to heal the water. To heal the water is to heal ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm grateful to you and to all of tonight's storytellers for sharing a piece of yourselves and your relationships with the river with all of us. 
On behalf of everyone at FMR, and indeed on behalf of the river itself, I want to thank you, our audience, for being with us tonight and for giving of your hearts and your resources to protect and celebrate our local treasure and one of the great rivers of the world. If you haven't already, now's the time to click on that donate button on the bottom of your screen and make a gift for the river. You should probably also check in on your auction items. Remember, bidding will be open until 9 p.m., so be sure to get in your final bids before it's too late. We hope to be able to gather together again soon, but in the meantime, we leave you with this, an invitation to return to the river as a place of peace and connection, and we give you the soulful words of one of our favorite storytellers, Wendell Berry. The peace of wild things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests its beauty on the water, where the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Thank you and good night. We keep to ourselves.